God's enduring promise to us through David. And I want to break it into sort of three sections. We want to look at the lead up to this promise. Um, We're going to look at the promise itself. But our main focus is going to look at what this promise means to us and how we need to implement it into our everyday life. So to start with, who is David? Maybe for some of the younger audience members and and, and teenagers or anyone, if if they're a bit quiet, who is David in the Bible? Has anyone got any answers there? Come on, someone give me something. Even an older member? He was the son of Jesse. Son of Jesse, excellent. Anyone else? Second king, brilliant. Yep. Oh, brilliant. So as people get more vocal, we can see he's quite a well-known character of the Bible. He's quite a, a um, popular character of the Bible. I did a quick list and it just reiterates some of the things that you guys said. He was a shepherd. He's from the tribe of Judah, which is quite important to the promise. He's a man after God own, God's own heart and I believe that's quite important to his response to the promise. He's a great writer of psalms and songs. He's the feeder of Goliath the giant. And yes, he is the second king of Israel. And that's just an artist's depiction of that great battle he had against Goliath the giant. So the second king of Israel, I want to take a step back and have a look at the foundation of of Israel. And, And if he's the second king, then kingship is quite a new concept to the nation of Israel. So if we take a look right back, I've got a little bit of a a family tree slash timeline of Israel. It starts all the way back at Abraham. Now Abraham was also a man that was given a promise. The promise that God gave to Abraham was, or part of the promise, sorry. And I will give unto thee in Genesis 17, and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. So part of the promise which is given to Abraham as the the forefather of of the nation of Israel is that they would inherit this land called Canaan. And that there is a picture of the land of Canaan. I'm sure we all know it well. It's the the modern day Israel today. Sits on the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea above Egypt there. So this land is promised to Abraham. He then has sons, Isaac and Jacob. Jacob then has 12 sons, and these 12 sons will become the, uh, the base of the nation of Israel. They'll become the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 territories of Israel. And right up until that point, if you can see up there, up until the point of the 12 sons, they're living in the land of Canaan. But it says there that Joseph is taken in 1898 BC to Egypt, and the rest of Israel moved down to Egypt in 1876. So they move out of the land of Canaan, the promised land, into Egypt, and that is because of the famine. And this is something we're doing in Sunday school at the moment with all our scholars. We're looking at this time period, and we've looked at that famine and and how God provided for the people of Israel in Egypt through Joseph. So they spend roughly 430 years in Egypt. And in Egypt, they grow. They grow um, extremely fast and extremely strong. Uh, we're told, so much so that Pharaoh is worried that the people of Israel are going to overthrow the nation of Egypt, which is uh, quite a feat considering Egypt was a a world superpower at the time. So that also fulfills another part of the promise of, uh, of Abraham, that they would be a strong seed, that the seed would be like the sand on the seashore and the, the stars in the sky. They had begun to fulfill this promise. So for 430 years, they're in Egypt. Finally, God sends Moses to deliver them back to the promised land. And we can see up there that in uh, 1446, they leave um, Egypt. Uh, They wander for 40 years and they come to the promised land and they conquer it. They have to overthrow all those people that were, were in the land of Canaan so that they could make it their own. And the conquest of the land of Canaan takes place in 1406. So Israel is now back in the promised land and for 350 years or thereabouts the Bible records the time period of the judges which is quite a turbulent time period. It it has the people of Israel forgetting about God. They suffer by attacks from multiple nations around about them. They then seek God again and God delivers them salvation in the form of a judge. 
And, and there are multiple judges, um, Samson, uh, just to name one, even. So they, this is where we come to um, in the time period of our story. They're, they've been for 350 years um, through the period of the judges, and now they ask for a king. That's what they ask. Now, was it wrong that they asked for a king? If you think uh, it was wrong, put your hand up. Was it wrong they asked for a king? One per was it not wrong they asked for a king? It wasn't. Sorry, have I got everyone confused? So this hand was, um, is it wrong if you ask for a king? And this is, uh, is it right if you ask for a king? Well, one, one hand for the right. And Mason, I sort of agree there. It's not necessarily the fact that they asked for a king, but I believe it's their motivation behind them asking for a king. Back in Genesis, when Jacob was on his deathbed, he blessed the 12 sons, those 12 tribes of Israel. And he says that Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. And unto him shall be the gathering of, uh, sorry, unto him shall the gathering of people be. So Judah is promised actually a kingship in his family line. So if they had asked for the correct king, I believe that would have been right. We find out their motivation for asking for a king in First to Samuel when they say to Samuel, "Behold, thou art old." And thy sons walk not in thy ways. Make us a king to judge us like all the other or all the nations. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So they could see around them, all the nations around them had mighty men of war that they could see and they could physically put their trust in. They had God who they couldn't see and they failed often to do this. So their motivation is, is wrong for asking for a king and their timing also. God would provide them a king in given time. So God gives them a king. He actually says to Samuel, go and anoint a man. And this is the description of the man that we have. There was a, Benjamin, uh, a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, a Benjamite. A mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upwards he was higher than any of the people. So this is the man who God says to Samuel to go and anoint to be the first king of Israel. And he's the sort of man that Israel were after. A tall, strong man, the son of a mighty man of power. He was goodly. The word goodly um, has been translated handsome in other, in other records as well. Um, so he's a good-looking man. He's, he's pleasing to the eye. And that is the man God says for Saul to anoint. Can anyone see there what the issue with Saul being a king may be? Just from that quote there. Throw it out. I can see the lips of Arnie Kerry saying Benjamin, and it's bang on. He is from the tribe of Benjamin. It's, uh, it's not the tribe of Judah which was promised to Judah where the kingship would come from. So straight away we sort of have red flags to say Saul probably isn't going to be the man for the job. And we know the chequered history of Saul and his almost um, psychotic changes in attitude and mind, and he doesn't last too long. It gets to a point where God tells Samuel, say, um, Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly, thou hast not kept my commandments, uh, the commandments of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be a captain over his people. Because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So Saul um, continually doesn't follow the instructions of God or the commandments of God. And he fails in leading the people. So God says, well, I'm now going to take that away from you, Saul. And I'm going to give it to a man after my own heart. And that man is going to be the captain 
over his people. So Samuel is told to go to the house of Jesse. And we know the story of him seeing all the other brothers and going up, oh, that this surely has to be the anointed one. Instead, he's asked to anoint David, a small, ruddy man, it says. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. I just want to pause here and just look at the, the small type that we have here in a newly anointed king. Now, Saul is not immediately disposed of the throne. He still goes on being the king and Samuel anoints David. So we have David anointed king, but Saul is still on the throne. So we have a newly anointed king in 1 Samuel 16. And the next chapter, we have the record of David's battle with Goliath. And here we have an awesome type of Christ, which to me just jumped off the page. A newly anointed king going up against an enemy that no one in the nation of Israel could defeat. There was no one else in the nation that had defeated or tried to defeat Goliath. He stands there clad in brass, a symbol of sin, and he speaks blasphemies against the, the God of Israel. He is God's adversary, God Satan, and David destroys him. He is a newly anointed king. I just found that really cool, jumping off the page straight there, and there's heaps of those types all through David's life. And that brings us to tonight's reading, 2 Samuel chapter 7. The period of time where God gives David this promise. And we read in verse 1, And it came to pass, when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest about from all his enemies, the king said unto Nathan, the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth in curtains. So David has been made king now. Saul has died in battle along with his son Jonathan. So David is now allowed to be anointed and, and can take over as king. And he sits in his house made of cedar and he looks around at everything God's done for him. And he goes, how come I'm dwelling in a house, but God is still dwelling in a tent? In verse 3, Nathan, uh, and essentially he's saying, I want to build a house for God. And Nathan said to the king, go do all that that is in thine heart. For the Lord is with thee. Now this response, even though um, God does go on to say that um, it won't be David to build a house for him, this response is pretty logical. If you're Nathan, a prophet, you're seeing a man after God's own heart, given peace within all the nations, um, it, it's pretty logical for Nathan to go do that which is in your heart because everything you've done so far has worked and God has blessed. But we read on in verse 4, and it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell thy servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house to dwell in? So he's saying, Okay, what's with this request all of a sudden, David? Are you the one that's going to build me a house? And the next few verses, verses 6 and 7, he goes on to explain that the whole time he's been with the people of Israel from when they left Egypt, he hasn't been in a house. And he hasn't asked anyone to build him a house either. And then we come to verse uh, 8, where he, he reminds David what he's done for him. He's brought him from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, and he's made him a ruler. And verse 9, 10, and 11, I believe this is where God is reiterating the promises made to Abraham, his forefather. Verse 9, And I was with thee, whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are on the earth. More, so, if we look back to Genesis 12, I'll make thee a great nation, and I'll bless thee, and I'll make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curseth them that curse thee. In all these, uh, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So that's the promise that was made to Abraham back in Genesis. And God has, in verse 9 and 10, or sorry, in verse 9, said that I've cut all the enemies off from before thee, so I've cursed them that curse thee, and I've made thy name great, like the great men of the earth. So he's saying that, look, I made a promise to Abraham all those years ago, it's roughly 1,000 years before David, and you are now fulfilling it. 
And I believe David would have known that he was part of the promise, just like we know we're part of the promise now. He's a man of God. He would have known that Abraham was promised these things. He goes on in verse 10 to say, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And that is also a continuation of that promise, even though it's not a full fulfilment of it. It's a continuation of the promise that the land of Canaan would be the people of Israel's land. So now we come to the new promise, the new covenant, which God makes to David. And we read from verse 11, halfway through verse 11 there, Also the Lord telleth thee that he will make their house... And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. By my mercy, uh, but my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words, according to the vision, so did Nathan speak to David. So verse 11 to 17, we have this new promise given to David. It involves a house, a seed that would be a king, and a kingdom. They're the three core sections of it. Now these three promises, they can be applied directly to Solomon. And there was a direct fulfilment in Solomon's life. He, um, he built a house for God. He built the temple. He did rule the kingdom of Israel. Um, and he was the, the direct seed of David, sorry, and he was a king. So he does fulfil those three promises. But there is also a future application to all parts of the promise because his kingdom didn't last forever it faded away the, the kingdom of Israel was divided and then it went into captivity and it was, uh, it, it was dissipated so there is obviously a future fulfilment of this um, promise that is to come and we can find traces of it as soon as we turn to the New Testament Matthew chapter 1 shows us the genealogy of Christ through Joseph, and that might be a little bit hard to see, I understand, but it's just showing you um, the genealogy of, of Christ right back from Adam. But if you can see from um, King David, the top half is the genealogy of Mary, the bottom half is the genealogy of Joseph. So Matthew 1 tells us the genealogy of, of Joseph, Luke 3 shows us the genealogy of Mary and I understand there, there, there may be some discrepancies with that and I'm more than happy for you to talk to you about them after but I believe that Luke 3 is showing us the genealogy through Mary so it shows us that both uh, Mary and Joseph are direct descendants of King David and that makes Christ the same flesh and blood as David as well as the rightful heir to the throne of Israel so that promise which was made, we can see that Christ fits the bill. He is the exact man to fulfil the promise which was given unto David. When we read Luke chapter 1, uh, when the angel comes to Mary, and the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give him the throne of David his father. So in Luke 1 we can see already when the angel comes to Mary, parts of this promise um, are, are said to Mary that, that her son would fulfil this promise given to David. He would, God would give him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob. We know that Jacob's name was changed to Israel, the house of Israel, forever. And his kingdom and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So this is the part of the promise which Solomon could not fulfil. He wasn't going to live forever, and the kingdom didn't last forever. So we can see here in Luke 1 the fulfilment of the future promise. Mary says to the angel, 
How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? She was a virgin. She couldn't understand how this was going to happen. The angel answered her and said, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And that fulfills the part of the promise which says, I will be his father and he shall be my son. Revelation 22. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify, uh, testify unto you these things in the ecclesias. I am the root and the offspring of Jesse and the bright and morning star. Romans 1 verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made the seed of David according to the flesh. Ephesians 2. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of all the household of God. And ye are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophet, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. This is Christ's fulfilment of the promise that he would build a house for God. It would be fitly framed together by Christ the cornerstone himself. Now I could go on for 20 or 30 minutes at least showing you the significance of the promise and how Christ fulfills it. Quotes all throughout the Old and New Testament point forward to it. But I don't think that's where the power lies with the promises, all the promises for that matter. We know them really well. We've been taught them from quite a young age. We learn them in Sunday school. We learn them before we're baptised. Uh, we hear lectures on them often. We know that the promises require resurrection because it says that David would see. It would all happen before David. But once again, just knowing it, I don't think, has the power to affect our lives. I want to focus on how these promises should motivate our life. They should be the central focus of our lives. The start of the promise, David wanted to do something for God. He wanted to repay the generosity which God had shown to him. But God flipped it on its head and he said, No, I will build you a house, David. I'm going to turn it right around. David was actually asked to accept the promise. He was not asked or told to give something. And I think this is the attitude that we need to have in our lives so that we live our lives by this motto. Often we try so hard to repay God because of what he's done for us. We need to do this or we need to go there. We need to do that ecclesial job. We need to pray more. Sorry. We need to read God's word more because it's the right thing to do and it's how we can be part of the promise. We get down because we sin, and that sin weighs us down. We lose sight of what God has set before us in these promises. He set before us a free gift. And in Psalm 89, when, it, uh, when David is talking about the promises, he describes it like this. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then I will visit their transgression with the rod. And their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie to David, his seed shall endure forever. His throne will be, uh, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever. As the moon and faith and a faithful witness in the heaven. Selah. So in David's view, it doesn't matter what we do. The promises will always be there, whether we like that or not. God has given us his promise. It can't be taken away. It can't be shaken. It will always be there for us. And that there is the motivation that we should live our lives by. We will sin, Psalm 89, it says they will transgress. But God's promise will still be there no matter what. And this is how Paul could say there is a crown of righteousness laid up for him with such confidence. Because, because there was. And there is for all of us too. Each of us have a crown of righteousness laid up for us. 
Paul says that. He says, not only uh, to me, but unto them who love his appearing. Paul says it, uh, that there was that crown for him because he had kept the faith. And here is the crux and the key to the, to the promises. It's faith. It's by faith in these promises that we can be a part of them or not. It's the faith that will inspire us to do God's will. Hebrews 11, a quote we all know, Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. The New Testament, in, uh, all through it, is reference of faith. And we can't please God without it. We need to shift our view from, I'm going to try and repay God with hard work so I can be part of the promise, to I believe God has a promise for all mankind that is unbreakable. And it's free for everyone to be a part of. And that's what motivates me to do his will. It may seem like splitting hairs, but this difference can have a true meaning. Uh, sorry, can have a meaningful effect on the way we live our lives. Romans 4 looks at this concept in relation to the promises and Abraham. Romans 4 verse 3, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace but as debt. But to him who not, uh, does not work but believeth on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So in Romans we're being told that the man that tries to work for, this, uh, for, for his righteousness... It's not by grace, it's, it's, he sees it as a debt and you're never going to achieve it. But the man that doesn't work but believes on him, then his faith is counted for righteousness. And that's not to say works are not a part of our lives, but it's just flipping it on its head. The faith comes first and that motivates the works. Now you might say that these books, especially in, in um, these epistles, are written to ecclesias who are struggling with the idea of Christ in the first place. They needed to see that the law was no longer applicable to them. But I think today we can also fall into that trap of having a legalistic mind to try and gain salvation by good works in the ecclesia. And it surrounds us in the world where the world shows us that we, um, it, everything works with money. Everything works with worth. You have to pay something off. Nothing is for free at all. So the world around us is telling us that. We need to step back a little bit and go, no, this gift from God is free and it is there and it will always be there. And that's the motivation for why I put my trust in God. It's only by this faith in God that, um, that we can be counted as righteous. Romans 4 goes on to talk about David in the same respect. David also describes the blessedness of man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So David come, came to an understanding that it was the, the faith in the promise that would be imputed as righteous. No works, no house that David could build would suffice God, would make God give him salvation. It was faith in the promises that would bring salvation. And you can see that because um, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, after the promise is given, David makes a prayer. And I've got a little study Bible. It's the prayer of acceptance. David is asked to accept this promise. He does accept it. And in 2 Samuel seven twenty seven. He says, For you, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have made this revelation to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore your servant has found courage to pray this prayer. And now, O Lord God, you are God. Your words are true, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. And I'm pretty certain that's from the ESV. If you were reading along in the King James, it might be a little bit different. So David says... 
that because God has revealed to him that he would build him a house, that's where he found his courage to pray. Because David knew that these promises were unshakable, that he was fulfilling the promise to Abraham, therefore the promise to David would also be fulfilled, that's what gave him the courage to pray. And then he goes on to say, your words are true, I accept this. Another instance in the, in the New Testament, for by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. So once again, it is, it is by grace and a faith in God's promise that should motivate our lives. Romans 10, here's just some more examples in the New Testament that confirm this. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart, you need to have faith in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart of man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So here we can see a bit of a, a second part to the faith. The heart of man that believeth, the heart that has faith in God, that will gain righteousness. And that belief will cause the man to confess. And the confession will bring salvation. So the faith, it doesn't just stop at the faith. You can't just stop at the faith and that's it. The faith does need to inspire us to do more. And finally in John 3... That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You need to have faith and believe in him, and you will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And verse 18 there are, shows us the first time where you can either be part of the promise or not part of the promise. It says there that he that believeth, that has faith, um, believeth on him, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So it's only by our faith and the limits of our faith that will keep us from being part of the promise which was given to Abraham, David, and David. So where do we get this faith? How do we gain the faith? Well, Romans 10 puts it clearly. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We only know about God because he has revealed himself to us in his word. And our faith grows from that. So if we have any faith at all, if we believe that God does exist, we would then want to probably get to know him more, surely. You're not just going to leave it at the basic. If you know something is real and true, you're going to search it out. John 17 emphasises that. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And I see it a bit like a cycle. You gain faith because you hear the word of God. You hear something in God's word and it rings true to you. And that's where your faith comes from. And then you find out more so your faith grows more. And it works in a continual cycle like that. They go hand in hand. Knowing God brings more faith. Hebrews 12 says that we have received a kingdom which cannot be moved. Once again, it looks at this idea that no matter what we do, that promise cannot be taken away. It is there forever for everyone to be a part of. And it says that we need to receive it. It's the same thing that David was asked to do, to receive the promise. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. So we see here what that faith and that acceptance of God's kingdom does. It allows us to serve God acceptably and allows us to have reverence and godly fear. By knowing God and by having faith in God, we know how to then come to him in a way that is acceptable unto him and, ple and pleasing unto him. 
just going to finish up now with this idea which Jesus um, expounds on in Matthew 18, the parable of the kingdom. Matthew 18, starting at verse 21. Peter comes to, to Jesus and he says, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I, shall, and I forgive him? Until seven times? And Jesus said, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. So Peter comes to Jesus with a bit of an uneducated question. And, and Christ gives him an answer which is so obvious. It, it, you, you'll forgive your brother forever, essentially. It's, it's a number that doesn't have any real meaning. It's just an extremely large number, and it sort of answers his question. And he goes on to a parable. Therefore, that answers uh, Paul's, uh, Peter's question as well. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought to him which owed him 10,000 talents. So the kingdom of God is like a king who's doing his, his books and his balances. He's, he's checking all the money coming in and going out. He's, he's all good and all lines up. And there's this one servant which owes 10,000 talents. Now, Bible uh, scholars and students have put the, the figure of 10,000 talents um, to around 2,000 days of labour, which is 500 and something years. It's, it's just a huge unpayable debt. I think people in the audience would have sort of laughed at that, that figure. It would have been so great to them that they would have gone, OK, there's no way that this servant could pay back that amount of money. So, 25, verse 25 says, For as much as he had not to pay, his lord, or the king, commanded that he be sold, and his wife and his children, all that he had, and payment to be made. So we find ourselves without God in the exact same situation. We have a debt that we cannot repay. The only thing that we can repay it with is our own life and it still doesn't pay for it. It just, we lose our life. So that servant falls down before the king and worships the king. And he says, Lord, have patience with me and I'll pay thee. This servant has got the mindset that he can actually make a payment, which is not physically possible. He's trying to make a payment that he can't make. He says, just, just give me a bit of time. And I feel I can be in that same situation. I'll, I'll, I'll say to God, oh, just, just give me a bit longer. I'll, I'll try better next week. I'll try and do this thing better next week. I'll try and pay this debt. But it's impossible to pay. And the Lord or the king of that servant is moved with compassion. And he loosed him and he forgave the debt. He completely wipes the debt. He says, it is gone. It is done. And he doesn't set up some sort of payment plan where he's got to pay him back bit by bit or he doesn't make him work in the palace to pay off this debt. It is completely and utterly gone. Exactly the same with us and the promise that God has made to us. God has said that Christ will take away all sin. That has happened. He has done that work. It's up to us to respond to that now. We need to receive that and work in our own lives accordingly. The same servant went out, we read in verse 28, and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. Now, the same scholars that talked about the large figure at the start say that that is about a day's wage, a hundred pence. Not a huge amount of money. And the servant lays his hands on him and he took him by the throat and he says, pay me what thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me, I will pay thee all. He does the exact same thing that this servant did to the king. But this servant, he would not. He went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. And the fellow servants saw that what was done, and they were very sorry, and they came and told the Lord, their Lord, all that was done. Then his Lord, and then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. So that's what's happened to us. We've been uh, forgiven a debt that is unpayable and we need to believe that and have faith in that, that we can then access the promises. 
And that should in turn make us and motivate us to act the same to our fellow servants. When someone does something to us, the motivation that the promise of God is there for us will motivate us to forgive them. And that's the message of this parable. Shouldest not thou also have compassion with thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And the Lord was wroth, and he delivered him to his uh, tormentors till he should pay all that was due to him. And it finishes, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespass. So we see in this parable that the debt is cleared, but it doesn't motivate, he doesn't accept that necessarily. This servant doesn't accept this in his life. But he goes straight out and he does what the king was going to do to him. And the message is we need to allow the word of God and this promise that is given to us come in and affect our lives so that we can show the same love that God showed to us in the promises to those around us. I hope that tonight that we have looked at these promises and that we have seen that they are so powerful. They should be the core of our life. They should motivate us in the morning when we get up. They should motivate us when our kids are getting annoying and our patience is, is getting thin. They should motivate us when we have the choice to do our own thing or the thing which God would rather us do. These promises should be the first thing that we think of in the morning. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, Jesus says, and I pray that we can do that and therefore show love to each other and then be part of the promise in the coming day.